Thank you very much, and it is indeed a great privilege to speak before such a distinguished audience. And I'd like to thank the chairman and the membership committee for treating me with such royalty. I feel very special at such a great meeting. So I'd like to spend the next 15 minutes discussing limb sparing surgery for bone sarcomas. And this is an identification of patients that I treated in 1990, right around the same time, and both had tumors of the distal femur. And you can see one young lady had an amputation and the other had a limb salvage. And the chart on your right indicates the treatment for bone and soft tissue sarcomas before 1985 at the National Institutes of Health. And you can see that the treatment of choice was an amputation. And what distinguished uh, surgical oncologist from a non-surgical oncologist or an orthopedic oncologist was the ability to treat extremity sarcomas at a proximal level. And an experienced sarcoma surgeon was someone who could do a hemipalvectomy, such as you see here, proximal, or a hip disarticulation, or in the upper extremity, a four-quarter amputation. And that was really the end of the talk. If I had given this talk in 1985, I'd be done now and we'd be all caught up and I wouldn't need the next 15 minutes. But what's changed since then is limb sparing surgery. We've had advances in orthopedics, bioengineering, imaging, particularly with the advent and the use of MRI, as well as advancements in chemotherapy and sometimes radiation therapy. Our indications for limb salvage is the ability to obtain a wide margin, remove the entire tumor, but still have acceptable function. Our surgical goal is to eradicate the tumor and prevent local recurrence, but also to still maintain function. And you can see this patient with an upper extremity sarcoma who had resection of the entire shoulder joint, a good portion of the lateral scapula, stabilization of the remaining portion of the humerus, and he's able to hold 30 pounds or nearly 65 kilos of weight in that extremity. Early on, we wanted to see if limb sparing surgery had an effect on survival, what the morbidity was, what the functional outcome, and what the psychological benefits were. And we found that in selected patients, and it's very important to state that not every patient is appropriate for a limb salvage, but patients who had limb salvage versus amputation had increased number of procedures. They did have improved functional outcomes versus amputation, and there may or may not be a psychological advantage or disadvantage, and this relates largely to patients' ability to adapt to their circumstances. In terms of quality of life, there was no change in terms of amputation with acceptance, ability to walk, pain, or psychological outcomes. And several studies show that limb salvage uh, compared to above knee amputation or hip disarticulation really had very similar oncologic outcomes and there was no difference in survival. Yet functional scores for limb salvage versus an above knee amputation or hip disarticulation for patients who had sarcomas in the distal femur showed that limb salvage clearly had an advantage in terms of function. As we approach or what our formula is in evaluating patients, we have considerations as to the patient's age, whether it's an upper extremity or a lower extremity, what the patient's lifestyle is, and what the psychological impact of the reconstructive options we have. Here you can see an example of two patients who had chondrosarcoma in the proximal humerus, one who required an amputation because his first surgery was a curatage, thinking it was fibrous dysplasia or another benign lesion. As a result of a bad first surgery, the patient on your right on your left needed an amputation, whereas the patient on your right had an appropriate biopsy and limb salvage. And here you can see one of the types of reconstruction we're able to do for patients who have pelvic tumors, which are particularly more difficult. Our pre-op considerations include the size, the relationship to anatomic structure, the status of the limb, and ultimately the patient's wishes. 
We used to talk about certain absolute contraindications, but advances have changed those so that now we talk more about relative contraindications. It used to be that if the artery was involved or the vein was involved, we weren't able to do limb salvage, but now we can do arterial bypass graft as well as putting in an endoprosthesis or another type of reconstruction and be able to do limb salvage surgery. We used to say that pathologic fracture was an indication for an amputation, but particularly for patients with pathologic fracture in the upper extremity as opposed to the lower extremity, patients with osteosarcomas who have a good response to chemotherapy can heal their fracture, and those patients can actually be managed with the limb salvage operation. We still have problems with inappropriate biopsies, and this is an example of a transverse biopsy. We prefer longitudinal biopsies. And here you can see the damage done with our interventional radiologist who goes after a lesion in the proximal left eye, thinking that this is a metastatic lesion because of the patient's age, only to find out that it was a bone sarcoma. And you can see the extents of edema and bleeding that extends all the way down into the lower end of the thigh with multiple compartments contaminated. Relative is infection because then those patients can't have systemic chemotherapy. And we used to say that immature skeletal age because of limb length discrepancy was a relative contraindication and those patients could better be managed with an amputation. Sometimes the extent of the tumor is so extensive that it's really not realistic to consider limb salvage surgery because the functional outcome would be disastrous. So we follow a formula based on four key steps, the biopsy, removal of the tumor, reconstruct the defect, and then the part that's sometimes very interesting is the soft tissue reconstruction to maximize function and minimize um, um, so infection by providing a soft tissue envelope. I like to say that you should think of the biopsy as the first part of a limb salvage operation that it's technically simple but cognitively complicated because we still see poor biopsies precluding limb salvage. And many of you are already familiar with the original article by Henry Mankin that looked at patients who were referred, who had major errors in diagnosis, changes in treatment related to the biopsy, and nearly 4.5% required an amputation just because of the biopsy. Unfortunately, this uh, study was repeated 20 years later, and the results were largely the same. So I want to take you on an anatomic journey, looking at the most common sites of bone sarcomas and how we address them. The first uh, distal femur, our preoperative plan, includes excising the biopsy, identifying the neurovascular structures, and then doing the reconstruction. So here you see a patient with a lesion in the lateral portion of the distal femur. CT better defines the extents of soft tissue component of the tumor. And you can see that typically we prefer to do uh, anteromedial biopsy, but you have to go where the tumor is. Here you can see our MRI and bone scan for staging studies. And the excellent response that the patients had to chemotherapy that shows marked area of ossification of what was previously a soft tissue component. And this makes our surgery much more easy and the ability to remove the tumor in a wide margin. Postoperative chemotherapy, again, imaging studies show you the biopsy tract, which is key to removal, and our plan depends on this. So our phase of surgery includes the biopsy, removal of the biopsy, identify the important neurovascular structures, and then reconstruct the defect. Reconstruction is based on whether the physes are open, tumor location, upper versus lower extremity, as well as the patient's expectations in terms of function, early use, and an approach that minimizes complications, the most common of which are fracture, infection, and non-union. Some of our options include metal prosthesis, allograft, composite allograft, and autograft, each with its own unique indications and its own uh, complications. 
Other reconstructive options less commonly used include arthrodesis, simple resection, and rotation plasty. Again, each have their own advantages and disadvantages, including in metal prosthesis, immediate stability, intraoperative ability to adjust the size and length so it's expandable, availability, and no risk of disease transfer. And here's an example of tumors in the distal femur, one treated with a very short prosthesis and the other with a much longer prosthesis. But the formula for identification and the steps of surgery remain the same. We have various different implant options, even in metal. One is a cemented prosthesis, and now more recently is this one on your right, which operates under the understanding of Wolf's Law that allows for a biological solution rather than simply a mechanical solution. So here you see an example of a patient with a chondrosarcoma, which you can identify with certainty without a biopsy. So in some cases, the best biopsy may be no biopsy, because the radiographic and clinical picture tell you that this can only be a chondrosarcoma and nothing else. So here you see the resection, the implant of the prosthesis, identification of the neurovascular structures, and at two weeks, the patient has pretty good function. You can see a little bit of an extensor lag and flexion, but this is two weeks postoperatively. Disadvantages include implant failure, difficult to attach soft tissue. For skeletally immature patients, there's an advantage to using allografts, but they have a high rate of nonunion infection, fracture, and a long healing time. Here you can see an example of a distal femoral osteoarticular allograph fixated in the previous generation using um, uh, locking plates and screws. Here's a combination of an allograph that was used in order to try and preserve the hip joint where a metallic implant may have required resection of the entire portion of the femur. So we're using techniques developed from total joint arthroplasty, as well as trauma surgery internal fixation. Arthrodesis has the advantage of being quite durable. This is an example of an early prosthesis used for a growing child, and you can see that this is an expandable prosthesis, but requires a big open incision. Now there are newer options for patients who require expandable prosthesis, such as this, which is done with an electromagnetic field and can be done over a short period of time, a little bit at a time, and not require any incision whatsoever. Rotation plasty is where the, everyone in this group knows it has superior function to an above-knee amputation, and patients do very well, but there are some social adjustment which may be important. And here's an example of an intraoperative rotation plasty where the tibia, an intercalary resection of the distal femur, and the proximal tibia is joined to the remaining portion of the tibia, rotated 180 degrees, and the ankle joint becomes the knee joint. And here you can see clinically what it looks like, and this patient actually looks quite comfortable. There are some cosmetic and psychological considerations, and there may be some difficulty fitting. Soft tissue reconstruction requires an understanding of the local flaps that are available, and sometimes we use our colleagues from uh, plastic surgery. But in most cases, local flaps can be done appropriately. Special considerations for patients with tumors in the proximal tibia, such as this. You can see the phase of surgery, the biopsy remains a critical point of where not to do the biopsy in the proximal tibia so that one doesn't contaminate the anterior tibial musculature. We identify and protect the neurovascular bundles, and thank God for the popliteus muscle, which allows us to do these kind of operations and have a soft tissue envelope. Once we identify the important structures and excise the biopsy, we reset the bone, and then the next step is noted previously, reconstruct the defect. Again, options include uh, metallic prostheses, such as you see here, and then for soft tissue reconstruction to maximize function, we do a local medial gastrocnemius muscle flap that provides soft tissue coverage as well as the ability to allow for good flexion and extension. 
If we can preserve the do joint and do an intercalary resection, we do. And here you can see an example of that, where we cut rather close and use internal fixation to allow for healing. A similar example with a uh, little less hardware, but ability to maintain the joint above the sarcoma. Expandable prostheses, as I showed before, had mechanical problems, and now expandable prostheses such as this can be used so that the growing child can still maintain limb length equality. Allograft reconstruction is best used for intercalary resections, such as this patient with an adamantinoma, and we chose to use a reconstruction in this case with an intramedullary nail. There are cases in the proximal humerus, again, following the same uh, outline. The biopsy should be in the anterior one-third of the deltoid. Here you can see the tiniest of biopsy tracts, and then we resect the tumor. In this case, because of invasion into the shoulder joint, we do an extra articular resection, and you can see the cut edge of the scapula, and the total joint is removed. Reconstruct the defect with a metallic prosthesis, and you can see the functional result of an excellent hand, wrist, and elbow, and truly a terrible shoulder joint. Here's a patient who had a total humeral prosthesis for a Ewing sarcoma, and you can see the function of the hand, wrist, and elbow are quite good. A similar patient, much younger, with a total humeral prosthesis, who was actually still continuing to carry out activities that I was not recommending in the short period right after surgery. And then the soft tissue reconstruction is relatively complex but well established. And here you can see this patient's reconstruction that allows them really quite excellent function. Other options include arthrodesis with or without autogenous grafting. Special considerations include the complex anatomy of the pelvis, such as this case with an allograft reconstruction, which I think nowadays there are better reconstructive options, but we use some of the techniques developed from our trauma surgeons in terms of internal fixation and arthroplasty colleagues for total joint replacement. Custom implants are now available and uh, patient-specific instruments to make the cuts to fit the custom implant really probably are a much better solution, although we don't have good outcome data. Other reconstructive options include the ability to spare the, the epiphysis in uh, patients who are skeletally immature. Here's an eight-year-old diagnosed with an osteosarcoma, and you can see that the tumor extends very close to the growth plate. This is pre-chemo, very close to the growth plate, but after chemotherapy, it appears that there may be the option to do a distal resection while preserving the knee joint. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of allografts in patients who are eight years old, so what we did was we took an adult tibia as the allograft donor and then artistically fashioned the adult proximal tibia to fit the pediatric distal femur. And you can see the preoperative planning involved. We make our cuts intraoperatively, assess the margin, ensure that we have a margin, and you can see the allograft fits quite beautifully. And again, an internal fixation with an intramedullary custom rod, and you can see this patient goes on to unremarkable fracture healing and really has an excellent functional outcome because of our ability to preserve the joint. I'll skip this last case or this next case of an 8-year-old, a 10-year-old, who similarly we reconstructed with a distal femur to fit the proximal tibia because we didn't have a 10-year-old proximal tibial allograft. Again, we customized the distal femur, inverted 180 degrees, and you can see how nicely those fit. And this patient, too, has an excellent functional outcome as a result of our ability to preserve the growth plate. So, in conclusion, limb sparing surgery for bone sarcomas is safe in carefully selected patients. They have a function superior to amputation, especially in the upper extremity. However, they do undergo more surgical procedures, and it still requires skill and judgment to determine the most appropriate treatment. Thank you very much.